So let's turn, if we can, and we certainly can, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Some of these verses that we're going to read, and I'll split the text for time's sake, we're going to read verses 12 through 14 and then add to them verses 19 through 24. Mark 11, 12 through 14, 19 through 24. And the two things don't necessarily seem to go hand in hand, but we'll try to take the whole passage and deal with them together this morning for a few minutes. I promise not to keep you longer than we need to stay, but that means absolutely <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Uh, are you having service tonight? Do you have service on Sunday night? Okay. See, we're good. <laughs> I, I, I won't do that to you. I, I really won't. I won't intend to do that to you. Amen. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. Have you found it? Yes. Nothing more important than looking at the Word of God. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he, speaking of he is Jesus, he was hungry. Our Lord was a human being. Yes. And he had physical needs. Right. Now, his spiritual journey and his spiritual goals were far more important than his physical needs. He often said, I have meat to eat that you, not need not, that you don't know not of, because he was so intent on con, uh, fulfilling the will of the Father. Yes. But here, he was physically hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply or perchance he might find anything thereon. Now, understand this as we go forward. The fig tree is a type of Israel. It's a shadow of that nation, this nation that God has chosen to be the head of all nations. It is not now because it has rejected its Messiah as a nation, not as an individual, but as a nation. And there's coming an hour and there's coming a day when God will restore Israel to the head of all nations. Amen. It's coming. Amen. It is coming. But in this point in time, he has a physical need. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Man, we can get dressed up. But we need something besides just appearance. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can look good. Anybody can come to church and look pretty good for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. We can behave ourselves for a little time. Yeah. <laughs> but do you have something more than leaves? Right. <laughs> when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Now watch, for the time of figs was not yet unfair. What, what, he's looking for food, and yet the time of figs, the time that these wonderful figs that could be eaten, it's not even the time for figs. So what's he doing? The fig tree had the potential of really producing fruit that you could eat two and three times a year. If it had leaves and it was April, this was the time right before the Lord's death, it also had the potential, hear that word, it also had the potential, the possibility, it might have these small buds. It's not the fruit of the fig that would come a couple months later. It's not the time for that. But these buds were actually a time for the poor and the, the people that didn't have much. They would eat these during this time of year. And if you came to the tree at that time of the year and it had no none of these little buds, it was a guarantee that it wouldn't have any of the good fruit even wow. in a couple of months. Wow. So Jesus was looking for those first initial fruits that should exist, not the figs. It wasn't the time for the figs, but it was time for buds and the poor and those that were destitute, and those that traveled oftentimes grabbed these buds for food. So he was expecting something and found nothing. It wasn't the time of the full-grown fig, but it was the time for the bud, and if the leaf was there, the bud was possible. Wow. <laughs> so when he says the time of figs was not yet, that was, that's what he means. Verse 14, And Jesus answered it and said unto him, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. 
Wow! Jesus comes to the tree. It's supposed to have, it could have, it has the potential of having something that can sustain him, something that could help him, something that would minister to him. It's not there. And he says, die! <laughs> now we don't think of God in that manner. But yet the word is replete with the fact if we're supposed to be producing fruit and we don't have fruit, the Bible says the Lord will cut us off. Excuse me, let me preach over here. <laughs> if we are potentially that person that should be producing something to help sustain the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world today, and there's nothing there. No growth, no fruit, no outreach. We look good, but all we've got is fig leaves. Oh, fig leaves, oh, wait a minute. Fig leaves is what Adam and Eve covered when they didn't have anything else. Right. Right. <clears throat> but if I get rid of my fig leaves, I'll be naked. No, you have the potential if you're a true born-again believer of producing fruit. That's right. You shouldn't just have the outer garments. You shouldn't just have the outer appearance. You should have something else. There should be fruit. And it can't, doesn't mean, doesn't mean, careful now, doesn't mean perfection. We talked about that last night. It's an unrealistic expectation for us to think that we're going to achieve perfection Sinless perfection in this time frame, but we have to have the attitude that Paul had, and that's this. Even though I have not yet apprehended, this one thing I do. I'm pressing for the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I may not have the figs that I want yet, but I'm going to certainly have some buds. I'm going to have something that shows that God is working in me. I'm not just... I'm not just a, a dress, dress up Sunday morning Christian. Come on. Amen. I have something going on in my life. Amen. Let's jump down to verse 19. And when evening was come, he came, went out of the city. Remember that this is the time frame of his last week. He would go into the city and minister and work and labor. And he would come back out of the city and usually stay with probably Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. It literally died within 24 hours. When God says it's over, Help us, Lord. it's over. And Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. Yes. Now I've got to make mention of this, even though it's a sidelight of this text for me this morning. The word of faith ministry has taken this and basically made the Christian God. I, I need to say this to you, and I say it in all love. If that's how you view yourself, it's incorrect. Yes. You are forever creation. He is forever creator. Yes. When you get that wrong, right, right. you mess it all up. Because he'll not share his glory with anybody. Right. Yes. There's nobody that can stand up and say whatever they want to and produce whatever they want to. That's not true Christianity to be honest with you, that's witchcraft. That's Mayanism when you study it out from its origins. But what is true is that when your spirit, your soul lines up with the truth of God's word, whether it's an individual promise that he's given you or a realization of a fact that he has said, we were singing it to, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, you can have that. I'm no longer a slave to sin. You can have that. Because the Bible says clearly that that is yours. So when I start to confess or say what God has initially said, see, I'm not God, I don't start it. 
I'm a created being, and I hear what God is saying, and then I say it. I don't initiate it. The words that come from my mouth mean nothing, but every word that comes from his mouth will not return unto him void. So when my confession or my speech lines up with what he has said, Amen. There's power in that. Yes. When faith connects with the Word of God, there's power in that. When faith connects with the purposes of God, there's power in that. And, and on the other side of the word of faith hurt that has happened because of that teaching, we have sometimes lost sight of the reality that, yes, our words have great power, but they have to be words that line up to the will and the purpose of of God in the earth. Amen. And now when I agree with God, there's something that can happen. And Jesus said it. He said, if you believe in your heart, not just anything I say, but what is God saying? And I say those things, and I don't doubt that this is a promise for me. This is a reality. He will have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and they might come. Yes. <laughs> he said you shall have them. Not because I initiate it, but because I get in line with God's word, and I begin to believe and confess and profess what it is that God has specifically for me and for the work of Christ in general. Yes. That's <laughs> When Jesus saw the fig tree, he saw a potential. Mm. But that potential, mm. which, was, which could have been, was not there. And as a result, he eliminated the tree. Wow. We live in a time frame, ladies and gentlemen, in which out-of-season fruit needs to be found yeah. in our lives. Yeah. And I want to minister to you this morning a message entitled, Out of Season Fruit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that with an understanding of the text comes the understanding of responsibility, but also comes the joy that we can believe and grasp and speak and see your promise come forth in the world and the earth and in our lives today. I pray for every heart that is troubled that this word will somehow establish peace and strength in you, O oh Lord, and that the believers and even those that right at this moment are not believers will place their faith in you and see what you can do in their lives. And I'll thank you for it and ask you for the anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Yeah. Ruth Garlock is a, or was a, I, she may not have passed away, but I think that age has probably caused her to succumb to death, is a missionary or was a missionary to uh, West Africa. She married the brother, or she was the, the sister to A.N. Trotter, a man that you've probably heard Brother Swigert mention time and time again. She grew up Ruth Trotter and married H.B. Garlock. H.B. Garlock and Ruth Garlock were responsible for opening up West Africa to the gospel in the early days of Pentecost. They went with no promises and no support per se that so much is organized, and I'm not against organization, I'm not against planning, that's not what I'm saying, but they just trusted God. And their ministry is recorded in a book entitled, Before We Kill and Eat You, because they were ministering to cannibals. They were ministering to people that ate other people. That was who God sent them to. And they ministered in a time frame when medical procedures were antiquated and they didn't help as they ought to, but there were some things that were, were dynamic and were available and helped people if you could get them. And one was a one was a drug or a, a, a vaccine for malaria. Malaria oftentimes would kill most of the missionaries that traveled to foreign countries in those days. And they had heard while they were there, Ruth Garlock and her husband, 
they had heard of a missionary, and I forget exactly the circumstances, but I'll relate it as best I can, that had malaria and desperately needed the vaccine, needed the serum, and they had it. But it was the time of rains in the area of West Africa in which they were traveling, and they got to the river that had to be crossed, but the rains had just swollen it to something that couldn't be passed over, a river that was too great. And, and just 100, 200 yards across the river is the person that needed the serum, and the serum is in their bags. They just have to get across the river, and there's no way to cross it. It's too swift. It's too fast. It's utterly impossible. So they set up camp on the wrong side of the river and began to pray. Lord, you've got to do something. Yeah. Can I tell you that prayer is still and should be always your first response to an impossibility? Amen. Yes. The power of you as a believer taking your need to God. Every time you open your mouth to speak or you open your heart, even if you don't say words, God hears your cry. Yes. And he answers. Yes. Now, every now and then he says no. <laughs> or he's slow to move. I have found that God doesn't always answer on my timetable. But I can always also say after 35 years of living for Christ that he has never failed to answer one prayer that I prayed. I may not even have seen the total finality of the thing that I've asked for yet, but I guarantee you, he will not fail you. My God can do anything but fail me. And so they began to pray, and they began to seek God. How do we get across that river? Finally, night set, and every go one goes to their tents. They had the people that were traveling with them. They had a variety of tents, and this, ri this river is raging, raging, raging all night long. And they went to sleep. But God did something that you might find difficult to believe, but it's recorded in their book. They went to sleep on the wrong side of the river. But when they woke up, the entire camp had been moved to the right side of the river. Let me hear you. Let me hear you. Let me hear me. They went to sleep on the wrong side of the river, trusting God, believing God, taking their knee, and they woke up on the right side of the river. And they, to this hour, can't tell you anything other than the fact that in the middle of the night, there must have been some angels that showed up and carried the whole camp, tent after tent after tent, to the other side of... See, when God wants to do something in our lives, He won't let anything hinder it if we'll trust him. Amen. And Ruth Garlock, years later, 1989, 1990, 91, came to Family Worship Center and I had the chance to meet her. And she sat on the platform in a chair because of her age and preached a message entitled Out of Season Fruit. Mm -hmm. And she said this, and I've never forgotten it, it's the basis of all I'm going to say today. She said, Jesus is still looking for out-of-season fruit. He's still looking to the trees that he has planted. And remember, Isaiah says that the righteous are the planting of the Lord. The psalmist said we should be like a tree planted by the water. And Jesus this morning is looking for a little bit of out-of-season fruit. Now, I've already told you the truth about the, the fig tree that tells us that there are two or three seasons in which edible fruit could come on that tree. So what does that have to do with you and me today? Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a time frame that is spiritually dark. I'll preach over here. <laughs> we live in a time frame that is spiritually dark. America has turned its back on God as a whole. Right. Right. Not as a complete whole, 
Because you're still here. I said, you're still here. There are still people that believe in Jesus Christ. But in my journey in these last 35 years, and if you've been a Christian for any period of time, and you've been around, say, the last 50 years especially, you have seen the transition of America, of a nation that respected God, but now is a nation that is rejecting Him openly. That's why we have what we have in our streets. It's what we have, what we have in our government. It's what we have in what we have in our homes and in our towns and in our schools. Not because God doesn't care, but because we have turned our back on God as a whole. We live in dark times. Several years ago, David Smith, and I love Brother Smith from the ministry, he said something. He said, America is in a spiritual civil war. Dividing itself between that which is godly and that which isn't godly. It's a time of darkness. And I said all that to not not make you scared. I didn't say all that to tell you that uh, things were impossible. I, you, you've been through 2020, a word, a, a year you won't probably forget very quickly. You've seen things that we've never seen before. We've experienced things that we've never experienced before. But I tell you that in this time frame of spiritual darkness where our nation is turning away from God, there needs to be a people that rises up out of the darkness and said, I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to sit down. I'm not going to just go away quietly. I'm going to declare what I believe. You can curse me. You can cuss me. You can burn down my business. You can burn down my home. You can tell me I can't go to church. You can tell me I can't worship, but I'll have none of it. I will stand in the truth of God's word and declare that man is a sinner and Jesus Christ is the sole Savior of the whole world. I will declare that lifestyles are not right just because you say they're right. I will declare that the Word of God tells us what is right and what is wrong. I will declare in this time of darkness that God is wanting to do something in every heart, in every life. God hasn't given up on America, but the majority of Americans have given up on God. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, it's time, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, it's time for some out-of-season fruit to show up. It's time for out of season what we least expect, what we think we can't right. produce. Yeah. What's unlikely, but yet what is potential. Yeah. Get it? What is unlikely, but yet is potential. What is unlikely in this time frame is that a church down in Patterson, Louisiana comes together every Sunday and every Wednesday and starts creating Christ in other lives, in the lives of each other, in the lives of... That's not normal. That's not... It's too dark. We can't... No, 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 no. It's just time for out-of-season fruit. It's time for out-of-season fruit. What isn't likely, but what is potential? Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. Do you see it? God is looking for something that might not be likely in our time frame. Not, 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 not might, might not be likely in our daytime. Might not be likely in our personal lives. But it's time for some out-of-season fruit. Yeah. It's time to say it looks impossible. It can't happen, but yet God can. I said it looks impossible. It sounds impossible. But I say to you, if you believe with all of your heart, what you believe will come to pass when it lines up with the Word of God. It's time for some out-of-season yes. Yes. fruit. There it is. It's time for some out of season fruit. The fruit that the church should be exhibiting is personal. And I said it last night, I'll say it again. We need to become something before we focus holistically on doing something. Now please don't wait until you're perfect to do something for God because you never will do anything for God. So as in the midst of our walking by the Spirit, 
Get the message from last night. In, in the midst of our living for God and letting fruit come, well, there needs to be fruit coming up in our lives and there needs to be fruit as a result of our lives. Yes. Out of season fruit, Pastor. We need the individuals in the church to become Christ-like first. And as they're becoming Christ-like, we need them to evangelize. We need them to reach out beyond our four walls. And you go into places that no one else will go. You see people that no one else will see. Uh, the media isn't going to get it for you. The media church isn't going to get it for you. Brother Matt is not going to get everything for you. You yourself walk in with the life of Christ wherever you are, and you can be a light. Right. You can shine that light wherever you go. We recently moved, which is an adventure all in itself. Uh, we're still kind of half over there and half over here, and it's hard for me to even find my socks to go on a trip. <laughs> Much less than... The things I'm used to. How many knows what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, so I stopped in at the AT&T store, which is always a, a blessing. <laughs> because I needed to make some changes to the, our accounts and what we're doing with the with uh, internet and things like that. And I stopped in, and I got a very nice young man by the name of Gerald in the AT&T store. And he, he, we, he, we started talking, and he said, well, what... What do you do? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a professor at a Bible college. I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a teacher. Oh, and he started to tell me a little bit about his spiritual life and what he had been experiencing. And I knew that I had an opening there. And the next thing you know, everybody else in the store is gone. And the three employees and me are having a shouting time about the things of God yeah. right in the middle of 18. What is that? That's out of season fruit. Yeah. You don't expect that when you walk into AT&T. AT&T just got the greatest message that it ever heard. And that was that Jesus is alive. But I ran, God brings you into those circumstances each and every moment. Look for them, long for them, ask for them, cry for them. And when they happen, open up your mouth and share your faith from the depths of the things that God has been doing in you. You don't have to know all things. You don't have to be knowledge as Pastor Matt is. You just have to have your own experience with Christ. Yes. And you share out of that. Yes. Out of season fruit. Out of season fruit. So you grow and you shine. You maneuver your life in Christ as a one that is productive because of faith and grace. I don't have time to teach all that again. We did it last night and I know Brother Matt does it consistently. But church, we need to be producing out of season fruit where it's least likely. Because Jesus, listen, He's still looking for some out-of-season fruit. Amen. Well, what exactly is out-of-season fruit? Let me give it to you for a few minutes so you can put it in your back pocket and carry it with you. Again, it's fruit that's unlikely, but potential. It could happen. How about this? A Christ-like attitude in a difficult situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when what you really want to do in response is pop them in the nose. Come on, brother. Right. Push them off a cliff and tell them God died. <laughs> now don't look at me as if you're laughing because I know that you've had those thoughts. Right. Right. Maybe not punch them in the nose, but for sure push them off a cliff. <laughs> That's right. Somebody hurts you. Or you just think somebody hurt you. That's right. Mm. That's good. It works either way. <laughs> How do you know? Well, I read it somewhere. <laughs> but they treated me so poor. They didn't, they didn't give me what I deserved. My boss didn't do this for me, and my wife didn't do that for me, and my husband didn't do this, and it, and, and it irritated me. And yeah, you're irritated. Yeah, you're upset. Yeah, you're facing something that's a difficult situation. You know what? It's time for some... Yes, yes. Thank you. It's time for some... Out of season fruit. It's time for a little...
patience. Yeah. It's time for a little love. It's time for a little mercy. It's time for a little understanding that maybe somebody had a worse day than you did. And when you entered in with your little issue, which wasn't so bad, they just blew up because you provided the straw that broke the camel's back on their day. Come on, somebody, help me here. Maybe it's just time that when we come to work and we see the boss that doesn't know God and he's having a rough day that we don't run into the restroom and go, hee, 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 hee. Instead, we go and we minister a little bit and we tell them how a relationship with God could maybe aid them and help them. Or, you know, when I'm traveling through a difficult time, I'm going to I'm gonna look to God. I'm going to count on God. I'm going to depend upon God to do something in me and do something for me that I see. Maybe we can maybe we can just produce a little out of season fruit in a difficult situation. Amen. Yeah. Instead of just responding to the flesh. Amen. We live in a time when most of the church is falling away. Do you understand that in the Bible, the Bible tells us that most believers at the last of the days will apostatize. Yeah. The Bible teaches us in Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity shall abound, speaking of the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. 2 Timothy 3, 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not going to get better. Luke 18, 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth. The Bible tells us that it's going to get worse before the coming of the Lord. And that most will apostatize. There's coming a falling away from the truth. Are we not in it? Yes, yes. So more than ever, we need a little bit of out-of-season out of fruit in regard to faithfulness to doctrine, faithfulness to the truth, faithfulness to hold to the Word of God, faithfulness to hold to what we know. Amen. Holding to, to, to the truth when most are falling away. I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Maturing and growing in Christ while most are spiritually shrinking. It's time to grow and Amen. show, not time to disappear. Amen. Your ministry and your Christian life is vital because we live in a time where we're desperately needing some out-of-season fruit in your life. Yeah. When you face things, and I appreciated the music too, when you face things that don't make sense to you, that are difficult, that seems to come against the promises of God, even though you're believing, even though you are saying what God is saying, you believe with your heart, there still comes a time when fear attacks. Can I say this to you, and I need to, because again, some of the Word of Faith teaching that we had is, well, if you're fearful, God's never going to do anything for you. Fearful. <laughs> Faith doesn't bring the end to fearful situations. Right, right. The, the Proverbs 3 says, Fear not sudden fear when it comes. Mm -hmm. For the Lord will be your strength and will keep your foot from being taken. He didn't say fear wouldn't come. That's right. He said the, the, when the fear comes... Look to the Lord. Amen. When the fear of failure comes, you feel as though you followed the Lord. You've done everything that he said, but still the walls of opposition are up. And it looks like you're going to lose, like you're not going to make it through, like you can't win, like you can't pay that bill, like you can't keep that job, like you can't. Come on, somebody help me here. It, it, you've done everything that you know to do. You followed the mind of God. You've obeyed the will of God. And Satan will, in those times, come to you and say, oh, but you you did, and you did, and you did, and you remind him what Christ did, what Christ did, what Christ did, because what Christ did, and your faith in it, is what qualifies.
qualifies you to be certain that God is working on your behalf. Not your perfection. Amen. Not your perfect reaction to every situation. <laughs> but Satan comes and tells you, no, this is hard. This is difficult because you, because you, because you. Satan is the accuser. He accuses you to God. He accuses God to you. God's not faithful. God doesn't like you because you didn't do enough. And fear begins to overwhelm and fear dominates. It grips the heart and grasps the mind and doesn't let go. Has anybody ever... Amen. You wake up in the morning and everything's fine for 10 seconds and then you remember. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Oh, uh -huh. and here comes fear. Right. Fear. Fear. Can I say that it, in dealing with fear, there is an answer, and, 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 and this is rolling through my spirit all week. You just need a little bit of out of season praise. Yeah. 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 Out of season praise. What, what, what are you talking about? When it doesn't, when you don't feel like it, when it doesn't look like it's going your way, when you don't think and you don't feel that God is within a million miles of your situation, then maybe it's just about time for a little out of season praise session. Maybe you need to find you a corner and start singing. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Listen now. Cast all your fears aside. What do you do? Run to his face. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's made a way for you by His mercy and grace. Did you hear that, devil? Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Cast all your fears aside. Run to His face. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's made a way for me by his mercy and grace. I don't get it. I don't understand why. I don't know what's exactly happening, but this much I know. He will never, ever, ever desert me or leave me to my own devices when my faith is in Him and what He has done for me at Calvary. So put on the garment of praise when you don't feel like it for the spirit of heaviness. Cast all your fear aside and run to His face. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's made a way for me by His mercy and grace. He just listen. He's worthy of a little out of season praise. I said he's worthy of a little. You don't see it yet. But yet in your heart you know that you know that you know that he said he would do this for you. And while you don't see it and before you see it and before it comes, before you hold the answer in your hands, Begin to thank Him. Begin to say, God, I believe that what you've told me is going to come to pass. I believe that this sin and this weight that has so easily beset me is going to be dominated by the Spirit of God as I place my faith in you. I believe in what Pastor said about giving, that He will open up the window.
windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can't even receive. I believe it before I see it. And I say it not because I'm making it happen through my speech, but because now my speech and my faith is lining up yes. with the Word of God. And God will honor what you say, what you believe, and the, the best expression is praise. Yes. It's a sacrifice of praise, the book of Hebrews says. Yes. That our lips ought to be constantly praising Him. Yes. You want to deal with the fear that comes with an unlikely situation? An untoward situation, an unexpected bill, a job loss? Sounds crazy, but you just might need a little out-of-season yes. praise session. As I've gone through life, I've found that it works. Not that I'm manipulating God. God's not nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> God's not upset. I'm upset. Right. Okay, that, well, that's not a good confession. I'm, uh, confessions that are true right. don't match well with lies. So right. if I'm dealing with something, I don't say, I'm not dealing with it. I'm not dealing with it. I'm not, there's not a pandemic. There's not a pandemic. There's not a pandemic. Amen. My saying that doesn't make a reality false. Right. Yes. Malcolm Smith wrote a book called Spiritual Burnout in the 80s. <clears throat> and honestly, Malcolm was one of my first teachers on grace. He taught me about grace before anybody else did. Uh, along with James Stone, who used to be a professor at the Bible College when I was a student. And he wrote in his book, Spiritual Burnout, a beautiful, beautiful analogy. And he describes this kingdom, this group of people that lived at the base of a wonderful mountain. Beautiful mountain. But the problem with living at the base of the mountain is that the enemies lived on the top of the mountain. And they decided that to get rid of the people that they didn't like in the base of the mountain, that they would take huge stones and they would simply push them off the top of the mountainside and down they would come, boom, 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 mm -hmm. crushing everything in their path, devastating the people at the base of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And Brother Smith said that Christians are kind of like this group at the base of the mountain, how they deal with it. They see the rocks coming and they say, one group, they handle that kind of issue by looking at it and saying, oh, whatever will be, will be, what, whatever will be, will be, whatever will be, thump, 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 will be, thump. Yeah. Well, you be gone, that's what you are. Yeah. And then there's another group that stands and they see the rock, literally see the rock, rolling from the enemies at the top of the hill down to the, their houses and the livelihoods in life at the base of the mountain, and they stand boldly and proclaim, that is not a rock, that is not a rock, that is not a thump, 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 thump. <laughs> and it's over. But the people that handle the situation aren't the people that say, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever will be, will be, or the people that try to deny the presence of the problem. But it's the people that stand and they see the rock, plainly coming towards them and they know the danger and they understand what could happen and they say, Lord, that's a rock. What are you going to do about that yes. rock? Yes. Amen. Lord, yes. What are you going to do about I can't. That's you right. can. Yes. Help, Lord. What are you going to do about the rock? That's good. Yes. So in your lives, when the rocks are coming, what are you going to do? What's your response? Amen. Put on the garment of praise yes, Lord. for the spirit of heaviness. Tell God you're believing Him and exhibit a little out-of-season fruit in the sense of out-of-season praise. <laughs> Bottom line is that the nation of Israel, just like the fig tree, has suffered immensely because it rejected the opportunity to accept their Messiah when he first came. And that can be documented. 
there are individuals of Israelites that accepted Christ and experienced his blessing and experienced fruit. How about you? The first step in anybody's life to experiencing the blessings of God is to admit that you're a sinner and accept Christ as your Savior. God can't work in your life the way that He wants to until you accept Him as Lord. And to do that, you have to first of all admit, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God by sin. And I don't have the wherewithal to make the payment for my sin. Christ died on Calvary to free you from the penalty of your sin. But if you never receive him, even though your debt has already been paid, God will hold you accountable for the debt. And that means eternity away from him. There can be no fruit in your life until you accept Christ. Secondly, there should be fruit. Fruit relative to your personal growth and fruit relative to your personal life outside of these four walls. Yeah. Amen. And in a time of darkness, in a time of hurt, in a time of pain, in a time of fear, it's even more important because Jesus is still looking for out of season fruit. But that fruit can't grow unless you come to realize the value of Calvary and the value of Christ. And when you see the value, by that I mean you understand what he did for you and what it means to you, you'll place your faith in him and you'll keep your faith in him and you'll keep your faith in what he did for you. And the fruit that you need, howbeit maybe slowly, will come. It's never as fast as I'd like it to come. Seems I'm always behind the proverbial eight ball of spiritual growth. I'm never where I just need to be. But I'm on my way. And if Jesus stops by my soul today and looks, I pray that he sees far more than just the leaves of religion and the, pe the appearance of someone who knows Christ. And it might be the small edible fruit that comes in April. It might be the fig, the full figs that come later in the year. But when he stops by me as a tree, a planting of the Lord, He's going to be looking for fruit. Yes. Now, the negative side of this is that if he finds no fruit, the Bible says there's coming an hour when he will cut away mm -hmm. the branches that aren't fruit-bearing. Mm -hmm. Israel was told at the time of John the Baptist's ministry that the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Speaking of their own nation, it's judgment time if you don't get it right. So I exhort you today, as believers, or even as people that are thinking about becoming believers, Christ is still walking the earth, Amen. looking for out-of-season fruit. He can only begin it in you if you're a believer. And if you're a believer, he expects to find it in your life.